Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, it's really good to see so many faces that I haven't seen as I left at the end of May for my uh, sabbatical time. And um, August, we weren't all here together, so it's great to see you all. We're gathered this morning at 8 o'clock with our 8 o'clock congregation, and now here we are, and the children are back, so it's really great. And so as we remember ourselves as the body of Christ, we look to the gospel to see what words of encouragement Jesus has about being a wonderful, strong community. And the first thing he says is, if one of you sins against another, <laughs> but thanks Jesus, we needed something positive today. We needed to talk about how joyful it is to come together as a community and as, as worshipers and followers. But you notice Jesus says, if, I say, when. <laughs> when we annoy each other, <laughs> when we cause each other to stumble, when we rub each other the wrong way, here's what's going to happen. And Jesus gives us some marching orders. And this is when we begin to see the difference between being a member of the Kiwanis or the Lions or the Rocky Brook Garden Club or the Women's Club and being a member of the body of Christ because we are given a much higher bar to, to reach towards. Jesus says, you know, if someone hurts you, offends you, angers you, you're not allowed to just run and uh, kind of um, heal your wounds and, and lick your wounds and wait for revenge. <laughs> Paybacks, right? That's the, uh, that's the saying out in the world. We're not allowed to do that. Jesus says, no, don't go and just let this fester. Here's a way for you to practice reconciliation within the body of Christ. And you know, when we're a member of other organizations, we can say, well, you know what? Uh, I'm not going to that meeting anymore because blah, blah, blah. Jesus knew how easy that would be for us to say as human beings. And so he gives us a very clear a way for us to practice reconciliation within the body of Christ, how we are to respond when we are hurt by each other. So the first thing he says is go by yourself. You know, don't talk to ten of your best friends about it to let off the steam. Go directly to the person and speak to them about it and see how that goes. And I have to tell you that uh, uh, I am someone who is really not very fond of conflict. You might say conflict averse. I was raised in a family where, you know, sort of keeping the peace and not making waves was a very high priority. So I wasn't given tools uh, to know how to address conflict, how to address, uh, you know, hurt feelings. You just kind of kept them to yourself. So it's been a, a real learning process for me as an adult human being and also as a priest. And, but I will tell you that when I have screwed up my courage and gone directly to people, it is um, an amazing and can be very surprising uh, experience of reconciliation. If that doesn't work, then you get to take a couple of other people with you. And, um, and go and talk to the person. And so in clergy circles, when a clergy person is having a problem with the parishioner and the one-to-one -one hasn't worked, well, then we bring the wardens with us. <laughs> and this is all very biblical because, you know, you need to, then, then the community comes together and the community can address this. And then you notice what Jesus says. And if that still doesn't work, Treat the person as a Gentile or a tax collector. And so it's easy to read that as treat them as an outsider. You know, get rid of them. You don't have to worry about them anymore. You tried your best. You can move on. But if we look at the Gospels, we see how Jesus treated Gentiles and tax collectors. He didn't write them off. He didn't exclude them. He went to dinner with them. He, inv he invited himself to their homes. So what he's saying here is, don't write that person off. Invite them to your home. Treat them with hospitality. Assume the best. You know, when we write people off, 
we're almost assuming the worst of them without giving them an opportunity to have a conversation. When we are hurt and we walk away and we don't address it, it can be a very disrespectful thing for us not to hold ourselves and each other accountable because we're assuming that that other person is not capable of more. And when we address hurts with each other and with the members of our families, however we want to see this, when we address those things, we are giving the other person the respect of assuming that they are capable of growing as a human being. And don't we want people to think that about us also? So when we provide that opportunity for a give and take, for a conversation, so often hurts are, uh, we take things personally that are not meant personally. You know, someone walks in the door on Sunday morning, they were up half the night with their baby or on the phone with a this or that. You just never know what's going on in someone else's life. And, you know, there's a conflict or a harsh word, and we take it personally. But if we have the opportunity to come back around, we can say, well, you know, I'm so sorry I was having such a bad day, whatever it was. We give that to each other the benefit of the doubt, which is really, as the body of Christ, what we are called to do. So I want to tell you a story about something that happened here at St. David's uh, probably about 10 years ago, because I think it was when I was coming back from being out on disability from my heart surgery. And being a nosy rosy, as soon as I get back in town or in, in the church, uh, my first question is, so what's been happening? You know, what's going on? What happened? What's the problem? Or is there any, you know, any issues? What do I need to know about? What do I need to address? And this situation was the very first thing that was brought to my attention. These, uh, it was during the process of preparing for the women's tea party, and it was probably maybe the, maybe that was only the second or third women's tea party that we had. And a couple of the women had been here working really hard, as we saw that this week, a few people working really hard, uh, getting everything set up for the tea. And they were dressed in, you know, old clothes, and they had their hair tied up, and uh, they were kind of resting out in the narthex in front and talking, you know, as we do, uh, before they went on home. And someone came in who uh, used the church for a brownie troop, and she saw them there, and she assumed they were the cleaning help. <laughs> now, that may not be a problem, except they were women of color. And so that fell into a very, very hurtful stereotype, one that the person who walked through the door didn't intend, didn't consciously make that decision to say that, but they were very, very hurt. Here they were working in their church that they loved so hard, and then this happened. So it was one of the first things I was told about. Now I knew that this other person was a member of another Episcopal church, and a, a, you know, a, a well-meaning, good-mannered uh, person, and so called her up, they, our two members came in and we all had a conversation. And they were able to talk about their hurt. And, and she was to, able to talk about how blindsided she was by their hurt. And how she had not even intended anything like that. And had made an honest mistake. A hurtful mistake. And so they were able to have that conversation. And able to learn from each other and for some reconciliation to happen. And so she continued to be here with her brownie church, and they continued to be members of, of our church and feel that this was a place that they were safe. This works. I recommend it. It's a good strategy for maintaining community. Because we as the body of Christ are called to treat each other differently. We're called to hold each other accountable, to be accountable to each other. We're called to air our grievances, not just keep them and fester them so that the next time something happens, you really blow up. Because this is work that's different than being in the Lions Club or the Rocky Brook Garden Club. It's work that's different than being part of a book club. This is work that is heartfelt. This is work that is very, very meaningful. And when we care very, very deeply about what we're doing, our elbows can get sharp. And when we're working together, 
hard, it can be easy to rub each other the wrong way. But when we have the opportunity to talk with each other honestly and hear each other in love, as Jesus asks us to do, reconciliation is real. It's not just something that you read about. It's real, and it happens. And it's what strengthens the body of Christ. It's what strengthens us as individuals and strengthens us as a community. Jesus talks about when two or three are gathered together, I'll be there, and that's why this works. It's not just at the altar. It's not just when we're in prayer here that Jesus is here. Jesus is with us when we have these difficult conversations, when we enter in love into conversations we would rather not have, but we know that for the good of our own hearts and the good of the community, the good of our families, we're going to have. So don't just think he's here only that two or three means, oh, we can have communion even if there's only two people. No, it means he's with us in all of these difficult times in our lives, in grief, in loss, in prayer, in conflict, in the good times and in the more, more harder times. He's there with us. That is his promise. And it's what we stand on as we come together as the body of Christ. Amen. Amen.